Welcome to English Mirror. This is the third episode on literary movements. Let's move on. Black Mountain Poets. The Black Mountain Poets, sometimes called projectivist poets, were a group of mid 20th century American avant garde or postmodern poets centered on Black Mountain College in North Carolina. Although it lasted only 23 years, that means from 1933 to 1956, and enrolled fewer than 1,200 students, Black Mountain College was one of the most fabled experimental institutions in art, education, and practice. In 1950, Charles Olson published his seminal essay, Projective Verse. In this, he called for a poetry of open field composition to replace traditional closed poetic forms with an improvised form that should reflect exactly the content of the poem. This form was to be based on the line, and each line was to be a unit of breadth and of utterance. The content was to consist of one perception immediately and directly to a further perception. This essay was to become a kind of de facto manifesto for the Black Mountain Poets. One of the effects of narrowing the unit of structure in the poem down to what could fit within an utterance was that the Black Mountain Poets developed a distinctive style of poetic diction. In addition to Olson, the poets most closely associated with Black Mountain include Larry Ayner, Robert Duncan, Ed Dawn, Paul Blackburn, Hilda Molly, John Wainers, Joel Oppenheimer, Dennis Lavato, Janard Williams, and Robert Creeley. Stream of Consciousness A method of narration that describes happenings in the flow of thoughts in the minds of the characters. The term stream of consciousness was coined by philosopher and psychologist William James in The Principles of Psychology, published in 1890. The term is often used as a synonym for interior monologue, but they can also be distinguished in two ways. In the first psychological sense, the stream of consciousness is a subject matter while interior monologue is a technique for presenting it. Thus, Marshall Proust's novel In Search of Lost Time is about the stream of consciousness, especially the connection between sense, impressions, and memory, but it does not actually use interior monologue. In the second literary sense, stream of consciousness is a special style of interior monologue. While an interior monologue always presents a character's thoughts directly without the apparent intervention of a summarizing and selecting narrator. It does not necessarily mingle them with impressions and perceptions, nor does it necessarily violate the norms of grammar, syntax, and logic. But the stream of consciousness technique also does one or both of these things. An important device of modernist fiction and its later imitators, the technique was pioneered by Dorothy Richardson in Pilgrimage and by James Joyce in Ulysses and further developed by Virginia Woolf in Mrs. Dalloway and William Faulkner in The Sound and the Fury. Bloomsbury Group or Bloomsbury Set a group of associated English writers, intellectuals, philosophers, and artists in the first half of the 20th century, including Virginia Woolf, John Maynard Keynes, E.M. Foster, and Lytton Strachey. This loose collective of friends and relatives was closely associated with the University of Cambridge for the Men and King's College Lenten for the Women, and they lived, worked, or studied together near Bloomsbury, London. Their works and outlook deeply influenced literature, aesthetics, criticism, and economics, as well as modern attitudes towards feminism, pacifism, and sexuality. 
A well-known court attributed to Dorothy Parker is they lived in squares, painted in circles, and loved in triangles. The group had 10 co-members. They are Cleve Bell, Venisa Bell, Ian Foster, Roger Fry, Duncan Grant, John Maynard Keynes, Desmond McCarthy, Lytton Strachey, Leonard Wolf, Virginia Wolf. All male members of the Bloomsbury group, except Duncan Grant, were educated at Cambridge. Lost Generation The generation that came of age during World War I. Lost in this context also means disoriented, wandering, directionless. A recognition that there was great confusion and aimlessness among the war's survivors in the early post-war years. The term is particularly used to refer to a group of artists and particularly American expatriate writers living in Paris during the 1920s. Gertrude Stein is credited with coining the term. It was subsequently popularized by Ernest Hemingway, who used it in the epigraph for his 1926 novel, The Sun Also Rises. You are all a lost generation. The writings of the lost generation literary figures tend to have common themes. These themes mostly pertained to the writer's experiences in World War I and the years following it. It is said that the work of these writers was autobiographical based on the use of mythologized versions of their lives. One of the themes that commonly appears in the author's works is decadence and the frivolous lifestyle of the wealthy. Both Hemingway and Fitzgerald touched on this theme throughout the novels The Sun Also Rises and The Great Gatsby. Another theme commonly found in the works of these authors was the death of the American dream which is exhibited throughout many of their novels. It is particularly prominent in The Great Gatsby, in which the character Nick Carraway comes to realize the corruption that surrounds him. Members of the Lost Generation include F. Scott Fitzgerald, Gertrude Stein, Ernest Hemingway, T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, Jean Rice, and Sylvia Beach. War Poets the First World War inspired profound poetry, words in which the atmosphere and landscape of battle were evoked, perhaps more vividly than ever before. The poets, many of whom lost their lives, became a collective voice, illuminating not only the war's tragedies and the irreparable effects, but the hopes and disappointments of an entire generation. Famous war poets were Wilfred Owen, John McRae, Alan Seeger, Vera Britton, and Robert Brooke. Harlem Renaissance An intellectual, social, and artistic explosion centered in Harlem, New York, spanning the 1920s. At the time, it was known as the New Negro Movement, named after the New Negro a 1925 anthology edited by Elaine Locke. The zenith of this flowering of Negro literature, as James Weldon Johnson preferred to call the Harlem Renaissance, took place between 1924 when Opportunity, a journal of Negro life, hosted a party for black writers where many white publishers were in attendance, and 1929, the year of the stock market crash and the beginning of the Great Depression. The Harlem Renaissance is considered to have been a rebirth of the African-American arts. The Harlem Renaissance was successful in that it brought the black experience clearly within the corpus of American cultural history, not only through an explosion of culture, but on a sociological level, the legacy of the Harlem Renaissance redefined how America and the world viewed African-Americans. Harlem Renaissance writers such as Langston Hughes, Claude Mackey, Georgia Douglas Johnson, Jean Toomer, and Sora Neil Hudson explored the beauty 
and pain of black life and so to define themselves and the community outside of white stereotypes. Orden Group or Orden Generation A group of British and Irish writers active in the 1930s that included W. H. Orden, Louis McNeese, Cecil de Lewis, Stephen Spenter, Christopher Isherwood, and sometimes Edward Upward and Rex Warner. They were sometimes called simply the 30s poets. Also, many newspaper articles and a few books appeared about the Orden group. The existence of the group was essentially a journalistic myth, a convenient label for poets and novelists who were approximately the same age, who had been educated at Oxford and Cambridge, who had known each other at different times and had more or less left-wing views. Max Ponde, a name invented by Roy Campbell in his Talking Bronco, published in 1946, to designate a composite figure made up of the four poets, Louis McNeese, Stephen Spenter, W. H. Auden, Cecil D. Lewis. The Irish Literary Revival An unfolding of Irish literary talent in the late 19th and early 20th century. It was closely allied with a strong political nationalism and a revival of interest in Ireland's Gaelic literary heritage. The revival was inspired by the nationalistic pride of the Gaelic revival and by the Gaelic League, which was formed in 1893 to revive the Irish language and culture. The movement developed into a vigorous literary force centered on the poet and playwright William Butler Yeats. Though he contributed to the foundation of the Abbey Theatre, the first Irish national theatre, he wrote only a few plays. His chief colleague was Lady Isabella Augusta Gregory, who took a leading part in the Abbey's management and wrote many plays. The Irish Literary Theatre, established in 1898, also excelled in the production of peasant plays. The great dramatist of the movement was John Millington Singe, who wrote plays of great beauty and power in a stylized peasant dialect. Later, the theatre turned toward realism, mostly rural realism. Lennox Robinson and T.Z. Murray were among the early realists. In reaction to peasant realism, Sino Casey wrote three great dramas of the Dublin slums, The Shadow of a Gunman, published in 1923, Juno and the Peacock, published in 1924, and The Plow and the Stars, published in 1926. In poetry, in addition to Yeats, George Russell composed two works of enduring interest. Notable among the younger contemporaries were Patrick Colum, Austin Clerk, Seamus O'Sullivan, F.R. Higgins, and Oliver St. John Gagathi. The Irish Republican movement had its poets in Patrick Henry Peirce, Thomas MacDonagh, and Joseph Plunkett, all executed in 1916 for their part in the Easter Rising. The Rhymers Club A group of London-based male poets founded in 1890 by W. B. Yeats and Ernest Rice, originally not much more than a dining club, it produced anthologies of poetry in 1892 and 1894. The first entitled The Book of the Rhymers Club was published by Elkin Matthews. The second book of the Rhymers Club appeared two years later in 1894, published by the recently merged Elkin Matthews and John Lane. They met at the London pub in Fleet Street and in the Domino Room of the Café Royal. The membership of the club shifted over the years, but included John Davidson, Ernest Dowson, Edwin Ellis, George Arthur Green, Arthur Cecil Hillier, Herbert Horn, Lionel Johnson, Richard Gillian, Victor Pilar, Ernest Radford, Ernest Rice, T. W. Rolleston, Arthur Simmons, John Todd Hunter, Oscar Wilde, and W. B. Yeats. Yeats later referred to many of these poets as the tragic generation. 
Thank you for watching this video. If you like the video, please share and subscribe.